Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Ryan, and uh, super grateful to be with you this morning. As we were reflecting in our our prayer time, we had placed a question on the screen. It's probably a little bit uh, unique of a question. I don't think it's something we think about that often, but the question was this. Um, how do you know that you're hearing the voice of God as opposed to the voice of another? How do you know that you're hearing from Jesus as opposed to the voice of another? How do you know in your life you're being led by Jesus instead of being led by the voices and the influences of others? Um, I'm sure in this space this morning there are people in all different aspects of life um, and faith Maybe your journey with Jesus is something that you've been you've been walking and following Jesus for a while. For many others, you've kind of ventured into this place. You were invited by somebody, and you're you're kind of figuring this out. You're seeking, investigating. You're curious. Maybe I want you to know. Thank you for being here. Um, this is a family. This church is a family. We don't believe the church is a an event you attend. It's a family you belong to, and so you are a part of this family. And so as we, we navigate this this morning, I really want us to think about this idea of what we are being led by, what voices we're being led by. Here's what I know about my life. There are so many differing uh, voices in life, influences in life. It can be hard to discern what is it that's actually leading me. Now, mind you, if some of us are massive or critical overthinkers, do we have any overthinkers in the place this morning? Go ahead, raise your hand. We know you're here. Gabe, I see you. Here's the deal. We, um, we are so in our heads, we can't even discern what voice is what oftentimes. I know this is, is true for me. I know this is true for so many of our friends. And so with so many different opinions and forces and voices, how do we know who we're being led by? How do we know who's speaking to us? I was speaking with a friend this week um, who's going through a really difficult time. And they were sharing with me um, of a situation that happened that was really um, bothering them. And a few days ago, um, they found themselves uh, in the hospital and they had were trying to get some sleep. And during this time, they heard a voice kind of speak to them during this time. I don't know if you've ever experienced this at night. You kind of hear yourself or you, you know, your, your mind is going crazy. And this voice spoke to them, uh, sort of a question slash accusation. And it was something like this. Do you know if you're really saved? In fact, are you truly saved? Do you know that? How do you know that? And so as this friend of mine shared this with me, I could tell that this question produced a massive amount of fear, uh, a massive, um, it was very troublesome, it had disturbed them, and in fact, it had bothered them so much that they had called me days after this happened to try to discern where is this voice coming from, and how can I know for sure this isn't God himself speaking to me? And I began to discern with them, how do we know whose voice that was? I know in my own life, there are so many times where I am distorted on Whose voice is truly leading me? Whose voice is guiding my life? How do I know that I'm being led by Jesus? So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at a text with this very idea comes to the forefront. An opportunity where we get to hear from Jesus as our good shepherd. And he's going to clarify for us some ways we can discern his voice. And be sure that we're being led by the good shepherd and so instead of so many false shepherds. We're in John chapter 10 this morning if you have a Bible. And uh, if you don't, that's okay. We put the scripture on the screen for you to read along with us. And before we get into the text, um, John chapter 10 verse 1, I want to give you a little bit of context here so you can understand who Jesus is communicating this passage to. In John chapter 9, we studied last week. Jesus heals a man who was born blind. This had never happened in the history of mankind, or at least anybody had known of. Jesus heals this man, but he happens to heal him on the Sabbath. And because of that, 
the religious leaders, the Pharisees, were really frustrated with Jesus for doing this. They began interrogating the man who was healed. They pulled his parents into the picture and interrogated them. And then they interrogated Jesus. And what we find is on a day where they should have been celebrating a man who was healed from being blind at birth, they cast him out of the synagogue and they kick him out of the church. Now in that day and age, the synagogue was the place of social life and experience. It's where you would, you would hear teaching and pursue the Lord. It would be similar as if we kicked somebody out of this church. And Jesus finds this man on the street, pursues him, and he reveals who he is to him. It says that the blind man believes in him. And to end of that space, Jesus receives a man who was cast out by the religious leaders. A man who should have been celebrated with and thrown a party is on his own, but Jesus sees him and finds him. Then, in that space, Jesus directs his attention to the very religious leaders who had cast this man out. And that's where we pick up in John chapter 10. What Jesus is going to do is he is going to create clarity for us on the distinction of false shepherds and the good shepherd. He's going to create clarity on the voice and the intent of false shepherds and who Jesus is, the good shepherd. So look at verse 1 with me. John chapter 10, verse 1, here's how the scripture reads. Truly, truly, I say to you, this is Jesus directed to the Pharisees. He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus begins this discourse on hearing his voice, on creating a distinction between the false shepherds of Israel and the good shepherd named Jesus. And he's going to use a parable that these people would understand, and that's dealing with sheep and shepherds. Now, I know shepherding is not a normal occupation in our day and age. Anybody crossed a shepherding profile on LinkedIn? Not a norm. Okay? But in this day and age, it was. So these people would have understood this. Um, and so in this parable, what Jesus is going to communicate is that there are, there's a good shepherd and then there are false shepherds that he would call thieves and robbers. Now, he's going to help us distinguish the two by knowing their voice. The only way we can discern who is who, according to the parable, is by discerning their voice. Now, a little background on shepherds. What we see in our text is we don't study shepherding a lot these days in college. Um, I did it, at least. I don't know about you. So, sheep, in this day and age, were kept in what's called a sheep fold. You might think of it like a pen, or your yard, your backyard. And in a sheep fold, this would have been an area that was enclosed by a sort of a brick fencing that would have a gate or an open area where the sheep could enter in and come out of. But what would happen is most shepherds would actually gather their flocks together. And so five or six different shepherds or families might all store their sheep in the same sheep fold. Think of it like a storage unit. Does anybody rent a storage unit here? Not one? Okay. We're just ashamed to share that? Okay. So uh, I get it. Like, I'm not telling you. So here's the deal. Imagine a few of us were like sharing storage together in a storage bin. Similar, they would store their sheep together. And so uh, the shepherds would enter, and what would happen is there was a gate, and the shepherd or the gatekeeper would guard that gate at night to ensure that thieves wouldn't come in and steal their sheep or rob their sheep or disperse their sheep. And so often the gatekeeper, also called a porter, would sleep horizontally through the gate in order to protect the sheep or to ensure that the sheep don't get away and wander. And so the shepherd would enter through the gate, but as we see, thieves and robbers would try to hop over the gate to disturb the sheep and lead the sheep astray. 
And so listen to what Jesus says about the shepherds when he communicates their, their intentions. In verse 3, it says, The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Did you catch that? So the key is the sheep hear his voice. He leads them. They follow him. He goes before them. They know his voice. And it says the shepherd calls his own sheep by name. It was uh, very common that shepherds would nickname their sheep. They would have particular names based on their relationship with this sheep, and they would call the name, and the sheep could respond. They understood the voice of their shepherd, and they could distinguish it among the other flocks. So the shepherd could come and lead them out. Now, why is it so crucial that a sheep knows the voice of their shepherd? So they can follow the right shepherd and discern the voice of a thief or a robber. A stranger they will not follow, but their shepherd they will. You see, the shepherd would have to come and lead the flock out of the sheepfold so that they could walk, go to water, lay down in green pastures, and rest and eat. You see, in a sheepfold, this was a lot of sheep together in one little pen. You can imagine what that smells like. So they bed here, but they need to be led out. And they go in and out and find pasture, and they eat, and they sleep, and they rest. So they need to know the voice of their shepherd. So how can we, as followers of Jesus, recognize Jesus' voice so as to be sure to be led by him? Here's the first point if you're writing notes. It's that you know the voice of Jesus by better knowing Jesus. Very simply put, the key to knowing the voice of Jesus better is knowing Jesus better. In verse 14 of this same text, if we can go there, look, it says this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. The verse that we reflected on before this in verse 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The way the sheep were able to distinguish the shepherd's voice is they know the shepherd. The key to discerning the voice of Jesus leading your life, rather than false influences in false shepherds, is to know your shepherd. How do you know your shepherd? How do you know Jesus? As his followers, we want to continue to be acquainted with our Lord so we can sense his leading. I'm going to give you three really quick things that are crucial to knowing Jesus to discern his voice. The first way we know Jesus to know his voice is what? His word. Okay? Many of us, this is the key to knowing Jesus. Let me tell you something. You will never be able to discern Jesus' voice if you do not read and study his word, to know his character, to be acquainted with his ways. Many of us, we think, you know what, I've really never heard the voice of God in my life. I don't think I've ever heard from him. And what I would say is, let's try this. Let's go to verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. You just heard the voice of God. Give it up for yourself. Oftentimes we are, we are so consumed with hearing a voice and receiving direction. But here's the key, guys. The whole point of hearing the voice of Jesus is knowing Jesus. The whole point of being led by the voice of Jesus is to know him. Think about your relationships in marriage. Why do we pursue in our relationships better communication? We don't pursue better communication for the sake of communication. We, we pursue better communication for the sake of better communion. We want to be closer with our spouse. We want to be closer with our friends. 
And so we pursue communication for the sake of communion. In the same way with Jesus, we don't want to get fixated on trying to hear a voice if we don't want to know Jesus. So the first place is his word. The second place, though, is this. That Jesus has given to all of his followers his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is transferred to every follower of Jesus to guide them and live within them and lead them. His Spirit is our helper, our counselor. So the Spirit guides us and leads us. And one of the ways we hear from Jesus is by the leading and guiding of His Holy Spirit. Now, I know this sounds a little cuckoo if you're new to hearing about Jesus and following Jesus. But this is how this works. A lot of times, tell me if you've ever experienced this, you'll be living throughout your day, you're walking throughout your day, and you sense an impression from the Holy Spirit. Something that gets your attention or a conviction. And God oftentimes is speaking to you through those, through those things. I'll give you an example. This past week, I was leaving my discipleship group, and I was hungry. So I went and got two tacos. Amen? Well, here's the deal. God was... God didn't want me to have two tacos. So I get my two tacos and I'm driving in my car to my staff meeting at Brown Coffee. And as I finish my first taco, I sense, hear me, I sense a impression from the Holy Spirit that tells me, don't eat the second taco. Now, there's no way that could be my voice. Would y'all agree? <laughs> would that ever be your voice? God would never, that would never be me. That's one way you can know God speaking to you is it would not be what you would come up with a lot of times. So I sense this and I have this impression I should take this taco into the coffee shop and offer it to a barista. Now, I thought to myself, there's no way they're going to want to eat my random taco that I'm bringing in a brown bag. So what I'll do is I'll just do this, God. They're going to say no and then I'm going to eat my taco anyways. So I'm going to kind of work around the Lord. Um, <laughs> So, so I decided to go in and sure enough, my buddy Nathan is working as the barista that day. And I just kind of, I didn't even want him to be able to know it was a taco. So I walked up and I just said, Hey Nathan, are you hungry? Say yes or no. And I just showed him a bag and he's like, I'll take it. And I was like, dang it. So, so he opens it. Obviously it's God's gift through a taco and he starts laughing immediately. And he turns to his co-worker, and they're both hysterically laughing. And I'm like, okay, what's going on here? And he says, well, Nathan's birthday was yesterday. And the boss had just told us, you know what, for your birthday, somebody needs to bring you a breakfast taco this morning. <laughs> and sure enough, God chose to sacrifice me <laughs> to fulfill his word to this man. And they began laughing about it and taking taco photos. And I was left hungry. <laughs> so, but I thought about this. That, that sounds like, obviously, that sounds trivial. And that's a minor story. But to me, it was incredibly encouraging. I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. I want to hear Jesus' voice in every step of my day. I don't want to manipulate it, but I want to be available to it. It doesn't mean that every story is like that. But for me... Because I know Jesus in time as I'm acquainted with him and his word and his ways and I know the spirit, I sense at times impressions that can only be God that I must act on. And here's the thing. I would rather have that story than that taco. Because when God uses you and he speaks to you, the satisfaction of knowing you're being led by Jesus is way better than anything else in this world. If you've ever experienced the Spirit speak to you and lead you and guide you to serve someone or help someone, it's the best thing in the world. Amen. So we want to be people who are led by the Holy Spirit. But here's a third way that God often speaks to us. It's through his people. Listen to this. There's a story in the Old Testament of a young man named Samuel. And I'm not telling you to do this, but his mom drops him off at the temple and leaves him, okay? Not necessarily the greatest case of parenting, but she had great intentions. He's left there with this priest, Eli, and one night he wakes up and he hears this voice calling his name, Samuel, Samuel. He goes in and he asks Eli, hey, Eli, I'm here, what's up? Eli says, I didn't call you, go back to bed. So he goes back to bed, he hears it, Samuel, Samuel. He goes back in, Eli, I'm here. Eli, I didn't call you, go back to bed. 
A third time, he comes in, and guess what Eli says? He says, oh, I see what's happening. God is speaking to you. When you go back to your room, say, Lord, your servant is listening. It took someone else who knew the Lord more to help him understand the voice of the Lord. Sometimes we need people in our life who are more acquainted with Jesus than we are to help us discern his voice in our lives. This is why isolation will destroy your life. Because as God is trying to lead you out, you have no one else helping walk with you. You have no one else helping discern the voices you're hearing. And what happens is the enemy will lead you into isolation to pick at you with voices and influences. And if you don't have someone else walking with you, you won't be able to discern the difference. Can I get an amen? So you need people who know Jesus, who are acquainted with him, who can walk with you. The key to knowing the voice of Jesus better is knowing Jesus better through his word, through his spirit, through his people. The second piece, though, that the scripture shows us is this. You know the voice of Jesus by knowing his intent. You know the voice of Jesus by knowing his intent. And I'm going to explain this. Look at verse 7 in our text. So Jesus again says, this is directed at the Pharisees, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. Check verse 10. The thief comes to only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, he does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I might may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and the authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father. Listen, you know the voice of Jesus by knowing his voice's intent. In order to distinguish between the false shepherds and false leaders and those who are not truly those of Jesus, we have to know the intent of the voice. And according to Jesus, the distinction between the false shepherd and the good shepherd is this, the intent. What does the false shepherd come to do? What's his motive? Steal, kill, and destroy. In fact, it says he comes only to do that. Jesus says that his intent is that you would have life and have it abundant. This is the intent of Jesus, your shepherd. He shows you his motive. I want you to have life and life Abundant. Those who come on their own terms, they seek to lead you astray. But I seek to enhance your life and to enhance it abundantly. Now, you've got to think, at this point in the conversation, the religious elite are really ticked off at Jesus. He is calling them out in front of the crowd. He's revealed their heart posture. These are the shepherds and pastors of these people. And he is saying, your only intent is, all those who came before me has been to hurt these people. But I came to give them life. Now, I was speaking with a friend this past week who was telling me about an experience in their life in ministry where they experienced serious church hurt. Now, I know many of you in this room are in that exact same space. You have gone to a body of believers and in that space where you hope to find life, you felt like something was taken from you, stolen from you, and in fact you walked away destroyed or distraught instead of enhanced.
This has been the experience of many people. And as I sat with my friend and discerned this through the conversation, what I realized was his example of false shepherds who had hurt him had in fact distorted his own view of Jesus. And it becomes difficult to trust Jesus because we no longer trust his leaders. And I wanted to tell you this morning this. Listen, in your life, in the church, people will fail you. But your faith is not in people. Your faith is in Jesus. I understand that oftentimes those can get distorted. But your faith is not in people. Your faith is in Jesus. So how do we, how do we continue to trust Jesus when we are so distorted by those surrounding him that we can't see him? Well, here's how. We see his heart and his motive for us. Look at the text in 10 where he says this. He says, his motive, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The false shepherds, they abandon the sheep. The wolf comes because they're a hired hand. They're not invested. They do not care. They abandon them. But Jesus shows you his heart by revealing to you that he will lay down his life for you. In fact, at the end of the text, he says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord, of my own authority. You might say this morning, well, you know, Jesus, he was crucified, but really, I mean, that really wasn't what he wanted. I mean, he was betrayed and he was taken advantage of. But no, what Jesus says is this was his plan all along. His plan was to lay down his life, to relinquish his authority to the Father. No one takes his life. He gives it freely. Now, why is that important? Uh, my pastor used to say this to me all the time. You never have to question someone's love for you if they lay down their life for you. You never have to question Jesus' love for you if you know he laid down his life for you. So knowing Jesus' intent, his heart, it helps you continue to trust his voice. That he is leading you and guiding you to life. He's always leading and guiding to life. So here's a couple questions I want you to think through as you process this message on discerning the voice of Jesus. I want you to think about this real quick. To my friends, voice you heard. And are you really saved? Do you really know me? Here's the question I ask. Does this voice communicate life or death? Does this voice you're hearing, does it sound like it's speaking life or speaking death? We need to know the intent behind the voice. Second question, does this voice build me up or tear me down spiritually, relationally, and emotionally? Does what I'm hearing or how I'm being led. Is this building me up or tearing me down? Here's another question. Does this voice guide me towards God or away from God? As you process decisions in your life, I want you to think. Do the voices and the influences in your life, the leadings in your life, are they pushing you towards Jesus or away from Jesus? I've been walking with a friend uh, recently who's going through um, a divorce and walking through the difficulty of this and trying to discern the voices in this. And the question is constantly, is this decision you're making, is that pushing you towards Jesus or away from Jesus? Is this voice or this leading leading you towards Jesus or away from Jesus? Jesus will never speak to you a word that would push you from him. He will only speak to you a word that would guide you towards him. And so you can know if it's Jesus, if the intent is to draw you closer compared to push you away. His intent is life and life abundant. The enemy's intent is to steal and to kill and destroy your life. And he will do whatever he can to accomplish that. But here's the good news, and this is our last point. Is this, our trust is in the faithfulness of God to lead, not our ability to listen. Our trust is in God's faithfulness to lead, not our ability to to listen. Look how Jesus closes his text in verse 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. 
and it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness about me. But you do not believe me, because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Look at the next verse. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Amen. What we learn is our trust, guys, as the sheep in his flock, as our good shepherd leads, our trust is in God's faithfulness to lead, not our ability to listen. This is really crucial that you hear me. How many of you know a lot about sheep? Not a lot of us. One person. Sheep are not the brightest animals. Would we agree with that? They have incredibly limited vision. For many of them, they cannot see except straight in front of them. There's no peripherals. They need to be led. If you're familiar with the psalm, it says that he guides us with, with his rod and his staff. He has to prod them and guide them and find them. And Jesus leaves the 99 to find the one. Sheep are not bright animals. So here's the intent of this message if you hear me. You can hear this message and think, okay, I as a sheep, I need to go, I need to be a better sheep. I need to go to sheep boot camp. I've got to work on my hearing. I've got to go get a vision check. I've just got to learn to be a better sheep. The emphasis of this text is not how great sheep are. The emphasis of this text is the good shepherd. Our trust is not in our ability to listen, but in God's ability to lead. Our trust this morning is not that I'm going to hear perfectly, that I'm going to get it right, that I'm always going to recognize the leading and the voice and the intent of my shepherd. My faith is not in my ability to hear. My faith is in God's ability to lead. Come on, somebody. Y'all are asleep. Thank you, God. Look, I, I realize this so much. In, in my life as I was pursuing dating Megan, my wife. She's serving in the kids right now because she's a saint. Come on. Go tell her, thank you. Take your kids. So, as I was pursuing Megan, what I realized was I was so terribly afraid to make a mistake. I was so terribly afraid that I was constantly listening and walking on eggshells and what if I choose the wrong person to marry? And what if I take the wrong path? And how do I know for sure this is God's will? But what I realized was I was putting all my faith in me. I was putting all my trust in my ability to hear God's will rather than in God's ability to lead me to his perfect will. Your faith doesn't need to be in you. When your faith is in you, it will produce fear and shame and guilt. And thieves and robbers will take advantage of it. But when your faith is in the shepherd, all I've got to do is just keep being a sheep. And I've just got to be available and let the Lord lead me and guide me and prod me and find me. And guess what? Even when I wonder and I leave the pen and I fail and I fall, Guess what? The good shepherd, he continually finds me. And no one can snatch you out of his hand. It's not just that you're in his flock, you're in his hand. God has you and he guides you. And my trust is in him. The confidence of your salvation and security and leading is not in your ability. It's in Christ's security. It's a part of his flock. So this morning, um, as we close, we... I want to come back to our original question. How do you know that you're hearing the voice of God as opposed to another? 
We know the voice of Jesus by knowing Jesus. First question is, do you want to know Jesus? Do you want to know him? He already knows you. In fact, if you're his follower, he calls you by name. He knows you by name. He has a nickname for you. I don't know what it is. But he has one. We know the voice of Jesus by knowing his intent. When's the last time that you went to God in prayer and expected him to speak life? See, most of us, we, we crawl to Jesus. We, we walk expectantly, expecting death, expecting punishment, expecting correction, expecting that the shepherd's going to put us back in our place. But Jesus says, my intent is life. If I tell you something, I'm telling you for your life and life abundant. So the next time you hear the voice of God and you read the scripture, you always filter it through life. How can I believe that this is God speaking life for me? Ryan, give up that taco. No, life. <laughs> I didn't know the life was for another person, but it was still life. And the last piece is that we remember our faith is not in our ability to hear, it's in God's ability to lead. And we can rest. We can rest today. If God can get Jonah, who's willingly trying to disobey him, where he's supposed to go, I think he can get you where you're supposed to go. So this morning as we close, I wanted to try something a little bit different, and then we'll get you out of here, is a listening exercise. To listen to the Lord's voice. God shows no partiality to any person here. He desires to know every person and does and desires that you would know him. So as Samuel spoke to the Lord, Lord, your servant is listening. Speak. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. When's the last time you ever actually intentionally listened to believe God would speak to you? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put up the most popular song in the Bible. We're going to read this song on your own as you reflect on it. And here's what I want you to do. In your heart, I want you to pray what Samuel prays. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And then I want you to focus in on a couple things. Ask God to reveal a word or a phrase or a verse that he wants you to hear in this song. As you read the song, focus in. Is there a word or a phrase or a verse that stands out that God, through His Spirit, is going to prompt you. When He prompts you on that word or phrase or verse, you're going to ask Him, what are you saying to me through this? What is it specifically you're applying this verse, this word, or this phrase to? And let Him speak. Alright, let's take a moment and do that together.